Hi everybody, it is Chris here from the Professional Beauty Team. Um, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar session. Um, I am joined today by Al Tepper, who is the founder of Tepfu. Um, if you were with us at Professional Beauty North, Al was part of our digital skills stage, he helped host that, so we're very lucky to have him with us again today. Um, just a little uh, notice just beforehand, so this uh, um, session, as with all of our webinars this week, are sponsored by Timely. Um, so huge thank you to them and obviously you can find more information on them in the Facebook post and also there'll be a link in here so you can find out more about Timely but that is uh, a little bit about Timely so yes um, Al thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here Chris thank you so much. So um, we are going to be talking today about building a content strategy to, so that you can smash it on social media um, which is something that uh, obviously, I am the social editor, so I know a little bit about Al knows a lot more than me, though. So we are very lucky to be joined by him. Um, so yeah, so Al, what kind of things are the best ways if you're looking at creating like a content schedule or strategy? What are the best ways to start going about defining that? Um, well, oh, sorry, I've got a terrible loop because I actually was trying to watch the video at the same time, <laughs> which is terrible. So first fail. So the first thing on social is beware when you go live that you don't have the video playing elsewhere. Um, uh, so yes, today, the purpose of today is to talk about uh, how to smash it on social with content strategy. Now, most of you watching uh, are not going to be social media experts or social media, uh, uh, you know, uh, diehards doing this eight hours a day um, and so what I'm trying to do, give you today is the quickest ways to solve the problems that I be, believe are the biggest problems when it comes to content strategy. So uh, should I go straight in Chris? Should I just yeah, deliver yeah, point certainly. one? All right, you, brilliant. You, 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 you get going. <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, so the first thing is I'm going to cover quite a lot of stuff. Um, I'm going to post uh, um, in the chat in the group as well. Uh, if you miss out on something, I, I know there's a recording, uh, but equally uh, you can message, uh, you can uh, join a free group. Um, I'm going to post that to everyone uh, in the attendees now. So there's a free group I have on Facebook you can join and I'll happily uh, tell you anything you want to ask the question for. So the first thing you need to do is you need to uh, know a bit about yourself and your customer. Um, you need to uh, ensure that um, uh, you have a good sense of who they are and what they care about. So the first thing you need to really understand is uh, what we call the wow. And the wow is what separates you along with your USP from your competition, because all of you will be operating in a space where there are other competitors uh, trying to win the business of the customers uh, that you're trying to win the business from. So the WOW and the USP to do two different jobs and they both support each other. The WOW uh, really builds the emotional connection between you and your customer and the USP builds the logical connection. Um, so the WOW, the way to figure it out in a hurry it won't be perfect. It won't be exhaustive. Obviously, if you're a huge brand and you spend millions of pounds with agencies, you know, you could take weeks and months working out a really deep wow. But for the purposes, for you guys watching this today, the best way I know to create the wow is ask yourself two fundamental questions. Why do you do what you do? Why did you go into hair care? Really dig deep and don't let yourself off the hook with an easy answer like, well, I wanted to work in a salon. Really challenge yourself. Get someone to ask you and get someone to keep asking you until you get to a really, really deep and meaningful point where you discover that actually when you were young, uh, you really loved your granny's hair and she took great care of her hair and um, she passed away. And so working with people's hair uh, reminds you of your granny. I have no idea. It could be that. It could be one of a million things. But the reason why that matters to your customer is because they want to know that you're a human being who cares about hair. If you're in the hair business, they want to know that you've been obsessed about hair since you were five years old and saw granny doing her hair, whatever. It's a differentiator. It sets you apart from everybody else. The second part of the wow question you need to ask is, after why you do it, why do they care? So what do people go to a hair salon for? Well, it's not to spend money and it's not to sit in a chair. By the way, I have very little hair, so I'm speaking from uh, many perspectives of assumption here. But clearly, people go into a hair salon to get their hair done uh, or they go to a skincare specialist or a uh, permanent makeup artist or whatever it is. They go for very deep seated reasons. It gives them confidence, uh, it makes them feel better, it makes them look better. 
whatever it is, you need to try and tap into the reasons as to why they're going to care. And when you take why you do it and why they care, when you've got both of those, what I want you to do is draw a Venn diagram. And if you don't know what a Venn diagram is, I want you to put the reasons why you do it in one circle. And I want you to put the reasons why they do it in another circle or why they care in another circle. And I want you to try and find the overlap because in the overlap will be the wow. The bit that matches up between why you do it and why they care is a wow moment. And when people say to you, what do you do? Oh, I'm a skincare specialist. Um, but my, my wow, the reason why I love it and the reason why you're gonna love letting me work on your skin with you is because of X, Y, Z. Hopefully what you'll get back is a wow, that's pretty cool, that's different. You're not just another skincare specialist. And that's the point. In that moment, you create an emotional connection. They now have a bond to you, even if it's a small one. So let's go on to the second thing you need to worry about, and that is USP. Um, the USP stands for unique sales proposition. The USP is the one reason, ultimately, that your customers will work with you. Um, that there is no other reason. Everyone thinks it's price, but I don't know about you, but I wouldn't pick a hair care, a skin care, or any beauty professional based on price because that's got to be a bad strategy. If you just go with the cheapest, that's going to be disastrous, obviously. Maybe that's why I have no hair. Um, <clears throat> so the reality is your USP is going to be something that screams value. So you've got to ask yourself, um, and you've got to get to your USP. And again, like the wow, the USP has to be really powerful and supportive. So this is the way that we believe you can figure it out in a hurry. And it's actually quite easy. You'll be quite surprised. You just need to ask your clients, as many of them as you can, what the single biggest reason, don't let them give you loads of reasons. You need to refine it to the biggest single reason why they chose you. Because when you ask 10 customers why they chose you, and if six of them say, because you're just the nicest skincare specialist around, great. That's a great USP. Uh, uh, my name's Al, I'm a skincare specialist. And the reason people love working with me is because they all tell me I'm just the nicest, I'm the nicest skincare specialist uh, that they've ever met. And I've got customers all over the UK. So you might even say I'm the nicest skincare specialist, specialist in the UK or whatever reason it is that the most reliable, the most credible, uh, the best value, the most available, the most caring, uh, whatever the angle is, your customers will tell you why they chose you. And that is the best signal for you to give to other customers as to why they should choose you. Now, why does this all relate to content? You're probably asking because your content needs to come from this. Where your content can't come from is superficial stuff that you think matters because it doesn't tie to a strategy and it won't back up your brand. I'm not saying you can't tweet something superficial. You're at the cinema and you're watching a film and there's great skincare evidence, uh, you know, in the film, the way they've done the makeup is brilliant or whatever. You could, you can absolutely push that stuff all day. You have to have some strategic element. So that's the wow and the USP. <clears throat> and, um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> Love that I of all people are talking about hair. I know it's a specialism of mine. I'm, I'm like you're brilliant um, for anyone that can remember. So the next thing I want to talk about is your ideal customer. Now we know your wow and we know your USP. Now I really want to help you figure out how to define your ideal customer. Because when I ask people about this, they often they often just give a vague answer. Who's your ideal customer? Well, anybody with hair or anybody with skin. <laughs> even more vague. It doesn't get more vague than that. Not everybody's got hair, but I'm pretty sure everybody's got skin. I don't know. Maybe there isn't. Maybe there's one person who doesn't, but pretty rare. So that's too vague. And the problem is that your answer to who's your ideal customer um, will tell and signal to other customers that you're right for them. So if, if, you know, if I'm a customer of yours and somebody says to me, well, yeah, but why are you, you know, why are you without, why do you go without for your hair? And they say, well, he's just good with hair. Well, that's not very inspiring. And if they read something on my Facebook page that's just really vague and bland about hair care, it doesn't really do much because most of my competitors are probably doing similar stuff. So, but if I really define my ideal customer, 
I can really get close to understanding who that is. When I produce content, if I can infuse content with that messaging for that ideal customer, if I talk to them, then if they're watching and they're listening, they will recognize that I'm talking to them. And that's the point. So how can you identify your ideal customer? Um, here's, here's a great list. I'll post it in the, in the chat as well. Chris, uh, if you can, I, I actually won't be able to do this on Facebook simultaneously, clearly. So I'll post. So when it comes to ideal customer, now you may want to add other things to this, but, um, but this is, this is the, these are the questions that I would ask. So there it is. Those are the ideal customer questions. Um, and you may add other points to that as well. But for me, it's about what's their goal? What, what's their goals and what's their primary goal? And I don't just mean, you know, hair, because that's obvious. I mean, what's their goal? You know, who's your ideal customer? If they are 20 to 30, their, their goals in life might be to uh, get a job, uh, stay in a job, grow their career, uh, save money, uh, and go and have a good time. Whereas if they're in their 50s, it can be a totally different set of goals, obviously. It's to provide for their grandchildren or or, or still be in their career uh, or to run a business or to look after their family or whatever it is. You've got to get the goals. Once you've got the goals, you then need to figure out what the challenges are. So what are the challenges? What stops them achieving that goal? Because if you know that staying in the staying, in, you know, growing their career is a goal, and one of their challenges is um, just being better than everybody else in that role, you can start to see how hair or skin might play into this. Because if they have uh, lots of uh, flushing skin, um, or, lo or or let's say they have terrible looking hair, actually, maybe it will be beneficial to them. Maybe they come to you on a, on a Friday because they know for the rest of the next week, their hair is going to look ace and it's one less thing they have to worry about at work. Um, so now you get to ask what are their pain points? So we know what their goal is. I want to grow my career. We know what their challenge is. My hair is always a mess. I can never keep it in order. So I have to go to somebody to look after it regularly. And we know their pain point is looking after their own hair. So now we know what they really care about. And now we can ask, where do they get their information? Well, they're all over Instagram. Okay, great. Um, what's the biggest reason they'd say no to working with you? Well, probably for most of you, uh, it's that they don't know you exist. Most of the time, the people don't know about you. Uh, what role do they play? Well, they're um, a managing director in an insurance company in Manchester. What age are they? 38, gender, marital status, kids. Try and build out that picture. What company do they work for? How big is it? Try and have that person in your head. Where are they based? It's probably going to be locally most of the time. What's their income bracket? Because that's going to have a massive impact on how you talk to them. Because if someone's earning 500 grand a year or 15 grand a year, I would argue that they're going to care about different things. What's their educational background? And when you've got all of that, I want you to play a game because you can see the last point there is avatar name. So this is your ideal customer avatar. And what I want you to do is I want you to give this person a name. I want you to, when you've got this picture, I want you to read it back to yourself, describe this person. And I want you to think of the first name that comes into your head for that person, whoever it was. And then that is the name of your ideal customer. And then what I want you to do is I want you to go to Google, get, get stages here, and I want you to type that person's name in. Let's say that person's name is Chris, because Chris has got great hair and he loves looking after his hair and he's growing his career. He's not in his 40s or 50s. He's young. He's got a whole career ahead of him. So Chris is your avatar. So you're going to go to Google and you're going to type in, someone just called me on Skype. That was really annoying. Um, that's amazing. It just so it proves it's live. There's no question. The way uh, technology works. Absolutely. And the problem is, of course, they'll probably call me back in about five seconds, uh, I suspect. So um, I don't know. Uh, I, can't, I can't work out how to deal with that right now. Um, it's all the way, always the way. So what I want you to do is I want you to go to Google and I want you to type in uh, Chris and, and hair. And there they are calling me again, rather predictably. Um, so um, I want you to type Chris and hair into Google. Um, and I want you to click on the images tab and I want you to find a picture of your ideal customer. Someone called Chris who has great hair or, you know, you might type in Chris and they're calling me again. That is just getting really irritating now. Uh, let me go and cancel Skype. Sorry to 
quit Skype. There we go. Nice and easy. The, the wonders, the wonders um, of, of, of live, of live stream. Well, it's, yeah. it's live. It's proof is live. Yeah. There's nothing we could do about it. <laughs> um, so what I want you to do is I want you to um, uh, literally uh, type in Chris Goodhair. Uh, find a picture of Chris. I want you to take that picture, print it off, put your avatar questions and answers underneath it. And every time you do any content, ask yourself, what would Chris say about it? Chris is your marketing team. Ask yourself, that's my ideal customer. There he is on the wall. It's Chris. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? I want you to have, literally, I want people to think you're going a bit batty. I want you to talk to Chris. you got Chris Hemsworth. Cool. That's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, absolutely. I want you to have a relationship with Chris, Janet. There you go. So I want you to talk to Chris um, and I want you to ask Chris what he thinks about the email you're about to send, the social post you're about to post, whatever it is. If Chris is your ideal customer, what would you say? Because if Chris would say, no, that's rubbish, honestly, don't do it. Resist the urge. So now we've got uh, our wow. We've got our USP. We've had four missed Skype calls. This is powerful stuff. Um, and we've got your ideal customer. You've got Chris Rock. Fantastic, Claire. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, so I want you to have a relationship with, Claire, with Chris Rock, Claire. There you go. It's lovely, isn't it? It's great. Um, so now we've got wow, USP, ideal customer. Now what I want to do is uh, we're going to go into content creation. Now you know a lot about uh, your ideal customer. You've got a really good sense of who they are. You've put them in the room with you. Now I'm going to give you two strategies uh, to uh, create amazing content. And if we have time, I might even, I might even give you a, a bonus strategy. Um, so the first strategy is called the matrix. So most of you, I'm pretty sure, will have seen the film The Matrix. Keanu Reeves, amazing series. Some people love it, some people hate it, but it's probably been seen by most people. Just taking a quick drink. So the thing about The Matrix that we learn is that they live in The Matrix and The Matrix is everywhere. And there's a real mindset shift when it comes to creating content that I think people need to understand. Um, you need to get into the habit of realizing that content is everywhere. You're just, you're just not looking for it and you don't know how to look for it and you don't know what to do with it when you find it. So I'm going to show you right now. So the thing about content being everywhere is I'm not joking. It literally is in everything around you all the time, all the time. There's a toaster sat behind Chris, right? That toaster has a relevance because toast fuels Chris and Chris fuels professional beauty professionals. Tell me I'm wrong. And the point is, if Chris posted on Insta a picture of his toaster and said, this toaster fuels me and I fuel you, how do you fuel your customers? I'm telling you, he's gonna get some likes. He's gonna get some comments because it's not often Chris. Chris, when was the last time you posted about a toaster? Uh, probably quite a while ago, to be honest. <laughs> I would imagine. If you'd have said yesterday, yeah. I'd have been very concerned. There you go. Beautiful toaster. Beautiful, but that's the beautiful, point. Beautiful new toaster. Stunning. <laughs> Stunning. Absolutely. Um, the point is, you can literally make content out of anything. Because, and here's the thing, when we're kids, we make believe, don't we? We make stuff up all the time. But as adults, we're told not to behave like that. We're grown-ups. We have to be professionals, God damn it! And they beat that creativity out of us. I would need you to get that creativity back because when you're making stuff up as an adult in a professional setting, there are connections. And I made a connection between that toaster, what Chris does and what you all do for your clients. It's just a toaster. All I did was make it up, but the connection is there. And if I say it's real, it becomes real. So whatever it is you do, you do for a reason. So I'll give you another example. Uh, this is an American football. I'm a massive American football fan. I'm a Green Bay Packers fan. Go Pack Go, if anybody's into American football. Why is this relevant to what I do? Well, I'm a marketing leadership coach. I turn business leaders like all of you into marketing leaders so you know more about your business and can do your marketing because most of us can't afford expensive agencies to do the marketing for us. That's life. We, had, we don't have enough time, which is why we all need to use Timely, by the way, so we get better at managing our time nice link. Uh, not paid to do that. I just thought it was appropriate. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of time, so we need to be super effective with our marketing. So I coach people on that. So why is this relevant? Because I'm also an American football coach. So I've coached guys, big, huge units with helmets and shoulder pads. And if I can coach them, I can coach all of you lovely people because none of you are trying to hit me. 
none of you are wearing body armor and are going to tackle me if you disagree. So by being an American football fan and an American football coach, I am a better coach for you. So the matrix is literally finding content in anything around you. And the way to practice this, it's a muscle you've got to build. And what you need to do is you need to challenge yourself every day, once a day. Just don't, don't luxuriate of the choice. Just look at something and pick it up. Put your hand on it. Pick it up and say, why is this relevant? <laughs> I've got an empty ramekin. It doesn't get much less relevant than that. And I can find a link to that, believe me. Um, if you do that once a day, you will grow that content muscle and you will just start creating content. And here's the thing. If I know my perfect avatar, my perfect client is Chris and he cares about his hair. And if I know that um, the wow that connects me uh, is because I loved uh, watching my grand do her hair and I just really love that and it really inspired me she always looked amazing when she went out and her hair was a crown and glory so I've always wanted to work with hair because I really feel that it helps people uh, gain confidence because it gave her confidence and um, because it puts me in a state of thinking about my nan uh, it makes me the nicest uh, the nicest uh, hair salon in town um, when I create that bit of content that's all going to play in. And I can say, well, this is a ramekin. Uh, the relevance of this ramekin is it's empty. And that's because uh, it was full of uh, pistachios and cashews. Uh, because, and secretly, I know that Chris is probably the kind of guy who likes pistachios and cashews because he, he looks like the kind of guy who likes, you know, likes quality, quality snacks. Um, so definitely. I eat it. There you go. I eat these every day um, because I'm looking after my health and I don't just look after health. I look after hair. Obviously, I don't have any, so I have to look after yours. Um, and I love working with Chris because he loves looking after his hair, too. And uh, it brings me brings me back to my childhood when I'm working with Chris as a client. It really helps me or people like Chris it really helps me remember the passion that people some people have for their hair. It's incredible. So, you know, um, yeah. So I'm going to go and get some more some more cashews um, and maybe we should talk about me working on your hair and, and helping you uh, feel strong. Blah, 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 blah. But the point is, whatever you're putting out on social now, if it's not connecting up the dots, then it's just random. And even though that may sound completely batty, at least it's connecting some of the dots and connecting some of the dots is definitely better than none of the dots. So the matrix is all about content that's all around you. I'm not going to say it's easy. You need to practice. If you if you look in the if you look in the um, the chat, you'll see the Tetfu uh, free marketing help group. <clears throat> you can post in there. You can practice in there, and we'll give you advice. But try and do it as as often as you can. The more you practice that muscle, the more you exercise that content creation muscle. I guarantee, the more it will work for you. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, Morgan Morgan Freeman. We all love a bit of Morgan Freeman. Uh, Morgan Freeman is by by miles the greatest narrator on the planet. Some people say it's James L. Jones. Uh, jury's out, but for me, it's Morgan Freeman all the way. So why am I talking to you about Morgan Freeman? Well, the narrator is the second most important content creation mechanism you have. I want you to imagine, this is where it gets fun, a little mini Morgan Freeman sat on your shoulder during your day. And I want you to imagine him narrating your day. And whatever content he narrates, I want you to imagine and ask yourself, Chris, what do you think about that? What, Nate, what, what Morgan just said? Morgan just said that we just had a lovely client left, but she's not, she's not an ideal client for us because she actually doesn't love her hair. She just does it because she goes through the motions. How do you feel about that, Chris? Oh, that really annoys me, Al. I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I, I think hair is super important. Brilliant. Okay, so now I've got, I've got Morgan Freeman. I mean, people must think I'm bananas, obviously. I'm having a conversation with Morgan Freeman and an imaginary Chris. But what's come out of that conversation is a social post along the lines of just had a customer. We had a customer this week who really don't care about their hair. And that really drives us nuts because we really care about hair. And we know that our favorite clients really, really obsess about the health of their hair and the shape and the style and the quality and the depth and the volume and, and, and the smell and the, the texture and blah, blah, blah. We know that our clients geek out on their hair and we geek out on hair as well. Do you geek out on hair? Because the point is, I want the people 
who geek out on their hair like Chris, because Chris is my ideal client. And he's exactly the kind of person <clears throat> who geeks out on his hair, which is why he has lovely hair. Maybe that's why I don't have any hair. So that's how Morgan Freeman has something to play in this whole content creation madness. And if you do this all, if you work all these muscles together, your content, I mean, I'm good at this because I do it a lot. I wasn't good at this 20 years ago. And if you do it a lot, you will produce content that will be differentiated from your competition, will be <clears throat> you know, valuable based on where you are, what you're doing, uh, will differentiate you from your competition, will help you stand out, will help you create emotional connections and will help you speak to your ideal customers. And what will happen next is you'll get more of your ideal customers. And everybody wants more ideal customers. The last thing we want are the customers. We, we've all got customers we don't like. That's life. There's always that one customer that when they leave and you shut the door, you sort of look at everyone else and go, that was hard work because it's inevitable. But what your marketing and certainly your content marketing should be able to do is to signal to those customers that you love, that you just luxuriate ever working with. You know, and if you geek out on hair, finding other people that geek out on hair, absolutely. It fills your soul because you love your subject matter and so do they. So you've got the matrix and you've got the Morgan Freeman, the narrator. Uh, there's one other thing I want to tell you. We've got four minutes left. So I think I'm on time. Is that all right, Chris? I think so. Cool. Yeah, that's all good. <clears throat> cool. I'm just going to avoid coughing and have a sip of drink. No, that's fine. And if you do uh, have questions, just while good. to... Do, do, let, do let us know over in the Facebook chat or in chat on Zoom as well. Awesome. And we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. So that'll be perfect. We'll be able to do loads. Um, so the last thing I want to talk to you about is um, one of the biggest problems with content, and I don't often share this outside of my Facebook groups um, and my WhatsApp groups, um, but I just feel the urge to share it with you nice people today because there's so many of you here, actually. I'm very impressed. Well done, Professional Beauty. Good work. Um, uh, one of the biggest problems with content creation, unless you're a professional writer, and I did see a copywriter. I think Jill Mullins is in the chat somewhere. She's a professional copywriter, and all she does is write copy, and she's a pro at it. But the rest of us mere mortals are not pro copywriters. And Jill's very relieved by that, I can assure you, because um, otherwise we wouldn't need Jill. Um, but here's the thing. I don't want you to write anymore because the problem is when you write, what happens is you have content in your head and then you try and logically order it word by word onto a piece of paper using one of these weird archaic things. Or if you're really weird, you might even have a quill. How weird is that? Um, the problem with doing it and creating content that way is our brains actually don't think like we think when we're writing. They think much more fluidly, much more uh, realistically, much more humanly. And that's because talking is more natural than writing. That's why we talk more than we write. That's why I struggle to keep a diary because I hate writing. I can think of all my gratitudes and all that really cool stuff and I have them in my head. But writing them down is such a chore. It's the same thing with social. Same thing with any content, by the way. It doesn't matter what channel, but especially for social. <clears throat> so there's a really cool trick you can use because I want you to write. I want you to produce more content than you've ever produced using what I've shown you today. But I don't ever want you to write again. And that sounds weird, doesn't it? Because how are we going to produce content without writing? Well, you've all got one of these. You can't see it because it's... Uh, so obviously my background is uh, hiding it, but you should be able to see my phone. And uh, I think it's on Android as well as, uh, as well as Apple. If you go and download an app called Otter, I've just posted it in the chat. Otter, I'm not on commission, but Otter, you need to sponsor me, man, because I'm telling everyone about you guys. I'm single-handedly making this brand go global. Otter is an amazing app. And what it does, I'll show you briefly because we've got uh, about a minute. Uh, when I run Otter, what it allows me to do, I hope this works, is there's a little record button here. And as I speak, because I can talk naturally now, and Chris has just asked me about the matrix, I can talk about the matrix. And I'm just talking. I'm not writing. I'm not slowing my thought processes down and turning it in word by word. I'm just talking. And Otter is transcribing. And it's free. And then when I've done that little mini interview in my own head and I've got that lovely bit of content out, I can stop it. I can cut and paste it. 
put it in Insta, take out the ers and ums, make sure there's no spelling mistakes, and then for the love of God, publish it. Obviously, don't publish something stupid and or libelous because, you know, that's just crazy. But give it a quick read. Make sure it makes sense and that it's not rude and mean. And then publish it. Because one of the biggest things stopping you creating amazing content is you. How many times have you gone to post something on Facebook and done loads of work and then you go, oh, I'm not happy with No, I'm not going to post it. Chris, how many times have you done that? I bet there's a couple. Oh, just, just a few times. Just a few. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, it, is. It's a, it, uh, it is a struggle sometimes. happens to all of us. Yeah, it happens to all of us. So we call that the palaces of perfection. And the problem with writing stuff is it's never perfect. It's never done. And we're always worried about what other people are going to say about it. So do yourself a favor. Talk isn't cheap. Talk is easier than writing. Use an app like Otter um, and get over the paralysis of perfection. And I hope that helps. We can probably go to questions at this point. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, well, huge, huge thank you, Al. That was really, really great. We've had lots of lovely comments, lots of people telling us uh, the different Chris's and the different hair that are um, <laughs> that have I see a up. meme. I see a meme starting here. Just, just a little one, just a little one. That yeah. and Morgan Freeman on my shoulder. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, so thank you, Al. Um, if you do have questions, please do let us know over on Facebook or in the Zoom chat. We have had a couple through that have been sent through already. Um, so one, th uh, one person did ask, what are the best ways to reach out to clients? So I think when you were mentioning about finding out sort of who yeah. um, your UAP, <clears throat> what would you say are some of the best ways to do that? Uh, if you've got a salon... Uh, go to go to Google and type in Google Forms um, and set up a free feedback form. And if you've got an iPad, load that onto the iPad. And before people leave, get them to fill in the form and tell you why they love you. You could just have one question. Why do you love coming to us? And let them write. And you can, you can do a prize drawer if you want, get their email address. There's loads of other marketing stuff you do. If you don't have a salon and you've only got a website, put it on your website. Or if you've got an email list, email your email list and ask them, why do you love working with us? Your customers will tell you. And by the way, what you'll discover <clears throat> is they'll tell you loads of reasons why uh, that they sometimes don't like working with you. You'll, you'll uncover all the problems and all the wins. Uh, it is called Otter Voice, Felicia. Absolutely. I believe so anyway. Yes, so that's what I would do. Ask them. They're, they're, your customers are everywhere. If you don't have any customers, obviously, that's a different challenge. If you're just starting, then uh, the different challenges you have to do. If you're just starting, you're going to have to do some freebies and you're going to have to get some feedback. There's no other way because there's just no other way to get feedback from customers until you have some. I hope that helps. Great. Um, we have had a question from um, uh, Amanda who said, what is the, how often should you be posting? So I think that is something that a lot of people do, do yeah, wonder okay. about whether they're posting too much or too little. I love this question. Now, there's a few different answers. If, you, if you're posting content for the algorithm, for the Facebook social graph or for LinkedIn or for Insta or whatever, then um, uh, you're wrong. I don't want you to care about the platform because the platform is never, ever, ever going to be your customer ever in a million years. Now, the platform is going to hopefully give you more organic reach, but don't forget an organic reach means show you to people for free. But don't forget every platform wants you to spend money. So I would invest all your time as I invest as I invest most of my marketing time <clears throat> on creating awesome content that my target customers cannot resist engaging with. And they cannot resist sharing with other likely ideal customers. So the best way, um, the best way to post uh, the right amount of content is as long as it's quality content, post it. If you're going to post 10 times a day and it's awesome, awesome, amazing content, sure, post it. No problem. If you're going to post once a year and it's utter rubbish, don't post it. The bottom line is this isn't a volume problem. This is a value problem. It's not about volume. Now, some people will tell you that if you post too much on a platform, it might downgrade the reach. But again, don't worry about the algorithm because if it's really awesome content, people will engage with it. 
less people might see it on a, a very small amount of less people might see it on LinkedIn. Every incremental post gets less love in a day. But if it's amazing content, you know, if Richard Branson posted 15 times a day on Instagram, do you think he'd get less less engagement? No, of course he wouldn't because he's awesome and it would probably be awesome content. So the answer is don't worry about the volume, worry about the value. Great. Um, we have a question from Deb over on Facebook who asks, um, are videos and lives more effective than a written post? So I guess that is also looking at things like algorithms and, and how that does affect things. Yeah, so, I mean, look, you know, a picture tells uh, a better story than words and a video tells a better story than pictures. Uh, interestingly enough, on LinkedIn, some studies have shown that actually uh, images and video don't do as well as slideshows, funnily enough. Um, and the reason is, is yes, the algorithm is going to treat different content differently. But again, it's the same thing. What's the video? I mean, if you're lucky enough <clears throat> to have Colin Firth come in your hair salon and you get to do Colin Firth's hair, um, I don't think the organic reach is going to matter because it's going to be interesting content. And if Colin says, yeah, I'll do a live testimonial for you, uh, uh, you're not going to turn around and say, oh, sorry, we've done three lives already today. The algorithm will punish us. You're going to get him on a live straight away. Of course you are, because it's about the value of the content. So um, obviously, if you can do more visual stuff and more video stuff, definitely, definitely advise that. I do always advise my clients to mix it up, though. Don't just do video all the time, because anything that gets a bit samey in the news feed, people skip past you've got to get their attention so if you if you only do text when you do a video watch what happens if you only do video when you do a text post watch what happens the trick is to mix it up keep your customer and your reader guessing give them something new every time and they'll love you for it if you if you make it powerful enough they will definitely and I think there is something obviously as, as well on that. There is the, the, the personality that can sometimes come across more as well, which again comes yeah. to showing your selling point and, and getting Absolutely. that. Um, and, it's that oh. and it's that personal connection as well. Sorry. That obviously video, if you can do video, and even if you think you're really crap at video, trust me, it's endearing. When people are rubbish at video at the start of their video career, I'm not joking. I can't tell you how many clients, uh, hi, my name's Al. Uh, this is my first video. Just by saying that, you get loads of support. Oh, well done, you. Oh, it was really good. You should do it more. Just be yourself. Don't worry about it. And even if you screw up, even if Skype rings you three times in the middle of a live, don't worry about it. We're all humans, you know. Yeah. And I think that it definitely is a very good point that there is that, again, the paralysis of perfection that you were talking about. I think people do sometimes think video has to be the way it has to be, you know, a Hollywood epic or something. And obviously, um, some Sarah has said, the posts I do either get lots of engagement or seen lots, never both. Is it a good to have a mixture or just good engagement? Um, well, there, there's different types of engagement. It depends what the outcome is that you want. You know, for me, the engagements I want are conversations. I'm not a hair salon. I, you know, I'm a marketing coach, so I want to uh, uh, unearth and start conversations with amazing business owners all the time. So if your objective is to get people booking through to something or buying something, you know, you're always going to do, you're always going to come at it from a different perspective. Or, there's no such thing as bad engagement. And it depends on the time of the day. It depends on the, qual the quality, the value of the post. You know, it's very easy to get freaked out when a post poorly performs but it's just if it's just a one-off you've got to get resilient to that you're looking at trends over time and I always say to people at the end of the day the, the one metric in marketing that you should be measuring is buzz and I don't mean that in a numerical sense you can look at all the stats you like you can have loads of stats um, and and we saw an influencer three or four what was it three or four months ago an influencer in America with three million followers launched a t-shirt range and she only sold six or 12 of them because actually you've got to take it from me stats only tell half the story what tells the other half of the story is how many people are talking to you how many people are truly engaging with you how many people have your content how many people share your content you know on a regular basis and you can feel that because when lots of people are loving what you do you just feel warm inside it's lovely when no one's caring about what you do you feel cold 
you feel like, oh, it's really chilly here. So you've got to move towards the heat. And the heat is in your marketplace, there's conversations happening all the time. You've got to be in the conversations and the heat's there because that's where all the air is, right? So you've got to find out what your customers care about, who they are and what conversations they're having and get stuck in, be a part of those conversations. And Even if you don't care about it. Sorry, go ahead. And it's, it's the measurable. It's like what you want to measure as well, which is important. Yeah. If you are valuing the likes, then, you know, that is something yeah. that you can work yeah. towards. Um, yeah. We've had a question on Zoom from Catherine, who actually says, do likes and followers matter? She also asks, do competitions and giveaways benefit my business? Uh, um, so I think the first time I ran a competition digitally was 2002. And, you know, I have to be honest, um, it depends on the outcome you want from the competition. Um, the best use of competitions that I know of is for data capture. The worst use of a competition uh, is for a direct customer acquisition. And the reason for that is that there are professional competition enters. They will just literally go around the web entering anything and everything. So you end up with a lot of polluted data. So like building an email list of competitions is really risky because the, the, the efficacy of that list is going to drop massively. And the same is true with your social profile because, you know, uh, uh, lots of people, and by the way, here's a big thing you mustn't do. And I'm sure lots of you will have done it, but it's too late. But if you haven't done it, don't do this. Don't tell everyone who likes you to tell everyone who likes them. Don't tell them to go and invite all their friends to follow your page <clears throat> because what happens is the uh, uh, the organic reach uh, gets watered down and less of the people who truly love you will see your stuff. Um, and that's the point. The same thing with competitions. What's the purpose of the competition? If the purpose of the competition is to differentiate you, you know, maybe you do a monthly competition where you give away a thousand pounds worth of product. I don't know. But that's a great differentiator. And it's a great social object to talk about on social media because then your monthly thousand pound giveaway becomes a thing. So people start to talk about it separately. Is it valuable for data or is it valuable for reach? They're, they're all good. It really depends. That's a great question to ask, you know, uh, but it needs, a, it needs a bit more understanding from our perspective of what you want the outcome to be, I would say. But on the face of it, yeah, look, I mean, all engagement is good engagement. Uh, just depends on the outcome you want. And I think just following on from that as well, where you were mentioning you're getting people to follow and it, it's, it's inorganic. I think one of the other big things, and it's something yeah. that somebody asked me recently actually was, you know, should I buy followers? And the answer to that is always no, always no, because it does, it messes up. Not only is it against the terms of service, but also it messes up your analytics and your insights on all the yeah. platforms. And there's two other, there's two other major risks there. First of all, uh, Facebook, if you buy Facebook likes, if you buy Instagram likes, if you've ever done it, stop doing it right now. That's the best advice I could give you and pray that Instagram never mass block everyone who did it because they will know who used that app to do it. Um, and so you've got to be very, very careful. Uh, you must, uh, my advice always is never do that. It never works. And, but it speaks to a bigger problem, Chris. And the bigger problem is that some people think and, and, and to some degree, it can have an impact. Uh, but, but in my experience, it's never been an issue for me. Um, but some people think that the number of followers matters. Honestly speaking, uh, I don't think it's as important as amazing content. Uh, you could have you could have a you could be a, a salon in the middle of Leeds with 100 followers on Instagram putting out amazing content and just not getting lucky breaks and getting loads of followers. But if it's amazing content, you know, people people will engage with you and hopefully over time you'll grow your likes. But it's it's not it's not the be all and end all. Don't forget, if you're a hair salon in Leeds, you don't need a million followers. Mm. What's a million followers going to do for you anyway? You're, you've only got four chairs you can only help four people at a time you know you've got to be realistic um so i again quality 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 all the way just avoid anything else and and don't fall prey to the it will make my ego feel better if i had more than a thousand followers be aware of the power of your ego to drive your marketing decisions it's not your your marketing your marketing doesn't need your ego your marketing needs your customer and and that's why referring to chris on the wall is super important what would chris say what would Chris say if he found out you bought likes? Yeah. Probably think you weren't very honest, maybe, you know. 
And then I think we have time just very quickly for one last one. We've got a question from Romina who asked, um, how should you handle requests for free product services from influencers? So beauty influencers or, or whatever they may be. Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, mostly because part of the problem, and, and most influencers are not like this, but there are some influencers who uh, will almost use their influence against you if you decline. And there's been evidence of that in, in news media of, of people kicking off and saying, you know, don't you know who I am? Right, I'm going to tell everyone on Instagram that you were an arsehole or whatever. But I said the word arsehole, sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, in fact, I said it twice when I said I didn't say it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think I think what, with caution, uh, I think you'll know within the first 10 seconds of the discussion with that influencer what kind of person they are. And I think you've got to go with your gut. And if you're worried, if you get the sense that there's any element of, if you don't, I will do X, I think you need to shut it down and, say, and just say, we have, we have a no influence for policy, I'm sorry. Um, we don't do that. Uh, and that's, you know, arguably one of the reasons to work with an influencer agency, if you're going to go down that road, you know, is with an agency, they're going to vet the influencers. They're not going to put up with influencers behaving that way. And it's going to be a structured business decision. But, but I would say that, the influencers most of you need are probably the micro and the nano influencers rather than, you know, I mean, you know, what, what is, um, you know, what's, what's a major influencer with 12 million followers going to do to a Leeds hairdressing salon with four chairs? I mean, you know, it could kill the business. You, you could just literally be oversubscribed and, you know, annoying people because no one can book for four years. So I, I think, and, and by the way, none of your regulars can book again either because loads of other people have done it. So, I think it's a bit, uh, you know, you've got to be careful. It's a bit, you could be playing with fire. Uh, if you're going to do stuff with influencers, do it properly, but that requires budget and do it through an agency. Anyone else who just approaches you saying, can I have some freebies and I'll talk about you? Be, be cautious and take a view on how you feel about their approach and their ethics. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Al. That's been such a really informative session and lots of love across uh, social for this session. So again, thank you very much. Um, if people want to reach out to you, um, there is the link in the Facebook, um, in, the, in the live chat. Um, are you on any other socials or anything like that that you want to give a shout out to? I am everywhere. If you type Al Tepper into the Google, I'm pretty much, I have the whole page all to myself. If you type Tepfu into Google, same thing. Find me on all the platforms. I've got loads of free stuff. I've got free groups pretty much everywhere. I've got WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, just, just get in touch, ask questions. I'm very loving and very giving. So I will, you know, do whatever I can to help. Thank Amazing. you so much, Chris. Well, thank you very much. And um, yes, so that's the end of today's session. Uh, and we will see you tomorrow. We are back on Instagram Live tomorrow afternoon. So do check that out. See all of our webinars on the Professional Beauty page. And we will see you soon. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you so much.